For the last few days, I've been reading about various Reddit members' run-ins with creepers, stalkers, and other downright freaky people. Now that I've gotten good and inspired, I figured I'd add my story to the list. This starts about five years ago. My family, consisting of myself, my brother Alec, and of course my mom, were moving around a lot. At this time, my mom was having a hard time finding a full-time job that paid well. On several occasions, we'd been forced to move out in the middle of the night. This would all change when she got on in a well-known lock manufacturer just a city over. The company even provided her with the money to rent a house near the factory, and things were starting to look up for sure. The move proved to be unremarkable as was our first few weeks in the new place. Despite being nothing special, it was almost paradise to us kids. The neighborhood was a regular working class area loaded with other kids and plenty of things to keep us busy. Ever since our dad passed when I was about 10, life had been pretty touch and go. But now it was almost like things used to be, at least for a while. During this time, we all did our usual stuff. Mom worked as much as possible and Alec and I attended school. Then, we started hearing noises. I was the last to notice them. I think Alec mentioned them once, but I wrote them off as nothing. Mom hadn't bothered to say anything for a few days, but one morning at breakfast, we all heard it together. This one resembled a ring chime on a phone. It only happened twice that morning, one after another. We all three began comparing notes and were relieved to know we weren't the only persons hearing things. We agreed it was probably a bird outside. This was not the only sound we'd been noticing, but for the day, we put them out of our minds and began discussing more important goings on. Nothing else of note would occur this day, but the idea had been brought up. We'd all be far more tuned in and probably wouldn't hesitate to mention anything new in the future. For the next few weeks, one of us would hear a bump on the floor or a scratching sound. We'd make a mental note of it and go on with what we were doing. On weekend mornings when we were all together, we'd mention the week's experiences. We even searched the house once and discovered a small hole leading into the attic. We figured a little critter was going in and out and making some of the sounds. There were still a few sounds that would have been impossible for a rat or squirrel to make. We thought we may have our answer, but some lingering doubts remained. The real trouble started when the food began disappearing. This part of the story affected me specifically. For as long as I can remember, I've had a problem with my weight. I've learned to control it in the years since, but my childhood was made very difficult because of it. This was made worse by my mom. She'd always been thin and beautiful and couldn't understand why I wasn't. When food began disappearing from the kitchen, she blamed it on me. This incident, in addition to a few others, damaged my relationship with my mom so badly her and I still don't speak that often. But you aren't here to listen to my problems. You want to hear something scary, and that part comes next. I'd estimate we'd been living at the new house for around five months. Mom and I were barely speaking, and the noises were still an ongoing problem. We'd since decided the house was haunted. Almost a month after covering the hole in the attic and another leading into the basement, the sounds continued. What had once been a strange problem had become frustrating. We'd all had our own issues. Alec himself had been having breathing problems akin to chronic bronchitis. he just started his freshman year of high school and was playing in the school band. He had been up and down with his symptoms. On this particular week, he had been doing well enough to go on a trip out of town. Unfortunately, soon after arriving, his symptoms blew back up and he was sent home for treatment. He arrived back home in the middle of the day when my mom and I weren't around. Things were quiet at first, but soon he heard noises coming from the front bathroom. He called out, but no one answered. Not thinking anything was wrong, he went to the door and opened it. To his horror, a man he didn't know was standing half-dressed, staring at him. He said the man moved toward him, believing he was going to be attacked, he fled from the house and ran to a neighbor's residence for help. This was where he stayed until the cops completed their search. What they discovered would destroy our newfound sense of peace and cause long-term damage. When I arrived home, Mom was still speaking with the police. 
My confusion quickly gave way to terror after hearing their story. As they cleared the home, nothing appeared out of the ordinary. That was until they searched the basement. There they discovered a makeshift bedroll under the stairs, hidden behind a large stack of boxes. Although the intruder was gone from what they found, it looked as if though he had been sleeping there for some time. I felt like I had been kicked in the stomach, and I became slightly hysterical for a moment. Once I'd gotten myself composed, I asked about Alec. He was still across the streets and refused to return home. His hands were shaking and sweat was pouring down his face. A few hours passed and the authorities had all they needed for the time being. We all returned to the house in a vain attempt to move on. The side effects began to show themselves almost immediately. Alec was eventually convinced to return, but he was never the same. Nightmares became a nightly occurrence. He was unable to sleep until Mom or I showed him the basement was empty. Worst of all, his breathing trouble grew worse by the day, and I too was greatly affected. Every minute inside the house made my skin crawl. As for Mom, she said nothing, but the strain showed on her face. Her sleep, too, had obviously been hindered. With no news of an arrest, we were all drowning in fear. We did all we could think of to comfort each other, but it didn't do any good. At the end of the seventh month, we moved into a new place. This was a three-bedroom condo without an attic or basement, and I remained there for another two years before getting my own place across town. I've been here ever since. After moving from the house, it seems all of our lives have improved. I'm fit, happy, and in a loving relationship. My mom found love with a gentleman from work and they married a year ago. Even poor Alec is doing well. His breathing problems slowly disappeared after the move. Doctors would discover his problems were likely related to the massive amounts of black mold we had been inhaling. After the diagnosis was made, the health department contacted the landlord only to discover the house had been demolished soon after we left. I see this as an omission of guilt. Alec's night terrors gradually lessened with the passage of time and from what he tells us, he rarely thinks about the incident anymore. I'm not sure he's being totally truthful, but I'm happy to hear it nonetheless. The intruder is still on the loose as far as I know. He's not even been identified. We'll probably never know the full story. He could have gotten in through an unlocked door or a window. At that point, he could have had a key made for the back door. Our big ring of keys that hung on a hook next to the kitchen wouldn't be hard to find. And from then on, he'd have free reign over the house during the weekdays. He more than likely heard us discuss our plans from his cubby in the basement. And that idea still gives me shivers. He'd be content in knowing when he would come and go safely without fear of being caught. That was until Alec arrived home unexpected. I suppose it's no longer important if he was arrested for his crime. All three of us have moved past the experience for the most part. Any long-term effects have dulled with time. A small thing does arise, however. I do wonder if our intruder has moved on to another basement. It's a part of the home most of us spend little to no time in. Perhaps you reading this are one of these people. Can you be so sure no one is lurking undetected below you? Listening to your every word and move. Maybe you should go check. Just to be sure. Somewhere on the windblown plains of Middle America, there stands a home. It's a regular unassuming home. Nothing in its appearance draws your attention, nor marks it out as different. But this home once held a dark secret, one that would remain hidden for the most part until today. You see, once upon a time, not all that long ago really, this was my home. I was among a small number of young men. We resided in the dark depths of the home's basement. Five in total, we existed there not by choice, but by decree. Our days were consumed in work while our nights were spent in dreaming. Among those dreams we often entertained the idea of freedom. Fortunately for myself and the others, one brave member of our community would make these dreams flesh. She is the reason I'll be able to share my story today. I suppose I should start with the larger aspects of the tale before focusing on myself. 
No real names or locations will be used. It all began way before I was born. Around the mid-1960s, a young charismatic preacher built a dedicated group around him. His theology was different from most in the faith. According to his teachings, Mary Magdalene was given the power to speak the word of God by Jesus himself. Upon his ascent to heaven, Mary effectively became the head of the Christian church. Through the generations, this line was passed down until our Holy Father, who traced himself back to Mary Magdalene herself, ascended to the position. This idea was surprisingly well received at the time. By 1980, he had amassed a congregation of over 3,500. However, as times changed, more and more devotees left the church for all number of reasons. When I was born in 1993, our group had dwindled to around 125. A few years earlier, the church had purchased a small piece of land in the upper area of the Midwest. All the buildings were built by hand, by the congregation. Everyone was required to live on this compound and all labor was evenly divvied among the members. It was very similar to the communes popular in the 1960s and 1970s. I can only assume our church was built around the same model. I'm leaving a lot out, but I hope you get the idea. The community was similar to the agrarian lifestyles of centuries past, and most work was still done by hand in my time. Machines were not shunned, still many took pride in doing things on their own, no matter the hardship. This was the type of family I grew up in. Now I'll take a few moments to better explain what led us to living in a basement. Almost from the start, females enjoyed an exalted position in our faith. They served as apostles and teachers to the young and newer members. Other than our leader himself, no man held any position of power. This was an accepted part and was rarely questioned. A male had to be married to remain in or join the congregation. In later years, our leader put a severe restriction on new marriages. Therefore, the younger males unable to find a partner or simply uninterested in marrying would be forced out soon after reaching the age of 21. Near the end, we became a little more than beasts of burden, strong hands for the field, among other things. The biggest change yet came in 1998. The Holy Father decreed that all males must be sent to live in the youth dorm at the time of puberty. For propriety's sake, the basement was termed the youth dorm, but we all knew it was just a regular old drafty basement. This pronouncement only served to further fracture an already ailing group. Unfortunately for me, my parents were diehards. We remained on the farm along with the last 75 or so devotees. When my time came at 13, I did as I was told and took my place in the basement. Although the adjustment period was difficult, a strong bond soon formed with my fellow prisoners, as I put it. From dawn to dusk, we worked ourselves ragged. Our only respite coming on Sundays in which we spent the mornings in holy services. The remainder of the day was our own. However, those who did not volunteer for additional tasks were required to remain in our quarters. While far more terrible things would be suffered by us during our time there, I'm still unfortunately unable to discuss them. Maybe it's better that they stay buried. Out of nowhere in 2010, an unlikely individual would change everything. Ruth was just another congregant, but by advantage of being born a woman, she held a leadership position in the church. Although not lofty by any means, it held a substantial amount of power nonetheless. Unknown to anyone inside the group at the time, she had been building a large body of information implicating the Holy Father and multiple crimes. On several of her visits into town, she met with law enforcement and their colleagues in the district attorney's office. They were especially interested in the Holy Father's treatment of males in the church. However, he had also been cheating on his taxes. This was the crime he was ultimately in prison for. When the day came that Ruth turned over all her documents to authorities, the church ceased to exist. A judge ruled our treatment to be inhumane and immoral, and we left the basement for the final time later that week. Everything else was handled quietly, behind closed doors, as to prevent embarrassment to the local community. When I was finally able to speak with Ruth face to face, I asked her why. She said the treatment of men within the congregation had always bothered her. Her father's in particular. And just the year prior, she had begun a secret relationship with one of the young men in the dorm. 
She knew they would likely not be allowed to marry as long as things continued as they did. The final straw was what she discovered while digging. The extent of the Holy Father's corruption sickened her. Her intent had not been to destroy the church, but she eventually realized it was inextricably interwoven with him. I greatly admired her, or any person willing to sacrifice everything for those they love. Fortunately, she had managed to build a respectable and happy life outside the church. My wife and I named our first daughter Ruth as a sign of respect to her. We also hope Ruth's selfless deed will serve as an example to her as she grows into womanhood. I couldn't think of a better woman for her to emulate. To close things out, I want to share the fate of my fellow dorm mates. It seems our horrible experiences haven't had any noticeable long-term side effects. All but one of us are now married, with families. Mark, my closest friend from the church, has been with his partner for some time. They too are discussing a future together. While this story does have many dark aspects, I'd like to end it with a positive message. I know many of us around God's beautiful creation have suffered terrible things. Many of us may still be suffering. Rather than my story being one of sadness, I prefer to view it as one of hope. Make note of this. No matter how dark things may be, hold fast and maintain faith. Better things are always waiting, just around the corner. When the headline screamed, Local Man Tortured in Basement, I was naturally curious. Little did I know I would soon be in the same position, not a week later. According to the story, a group of home invaders had burst into a nearby jewel dealer's home to steal a stash of diamonds he was rumored to have on site. Having caught the dealer unaware, they demanded to know the location of said stash. The dealer, as it would turn out, truthfully told the gang no such jewel stash existed. What he did have was an empty safe in his bedroom closet. This revelation didn't make the group happy. They chose to disbelieve the homeowner, and for the next hour, the burglars took turns torturing him for the location of the non-existent stash. It would be the arrival of a nosy neighbor that would cause the thieves to scatter. But by this point, the homeowner was mere minutes from death had he not been rushed to the hospital. It was a harrowing story to be sure, but never once had I ever thought that I was in any danger. The extent of my riches amassed to about 25 grand or so. This consisted of a 19th century gold and silver coin collection my father had left me. I had just had the collection appraised the year before. This is probably where I was chosen as a target. The appraiser offered me 10,000, but I kindly declined. The coin sat collecting dust in my floor safe after that. A week or more went by. I was loafing on my couch watching a movie. It was about 2 p.m. on a Saturday when a loud crashing sound came from the front door. I was so focused on the television I nearly jumped out of my skin, and I peeked around the corner in time to see three masked figures pouring one by one through my shattered door. They were surrounding me, guns raised within a few seconds. I was told to get on my knees, and naturally I did. My heart was pounding and my mouth bone dry. Instead of shooting me, one of them demanded I give him the combination to my safe. This was the first moment that I realized who I was dealing with. I tried to play dumb. There's no safe. Why would I have a safe? I said. I know. My ability to lie is usually better, but I wasn't exactly prepared. The shortest of the group gave me a quick attitude correction with the barrel of his pistol. Still, my pride wouldn't allow me to tell. Actually, my pride and my love for my father, to be honest. I wouldn't be caught dead if I was going to let some thug steal his life's work. Had I been more clear-headed, I would have chosen a wiser path. To their credit, I was given plenty of opportunity to concede, but once they had me tied up, in the basement, they were all business. Even as they tightened the knots and applied the gag, I was convinced that it was all a fear tactic. Surely, after what happened to the jeweler, they wouldn't repeat their mistake. By God, was I wrong. Right out of the gate, my left hand was smashed with a hammer. The pain was unimaginable. My right was next. 
This was even worse, if that's possible. I was ready to tell anything at this point, but I had angered them, and I was going to pay for it. My feet were next, then my knees. I was barely conscious now. Only then was I allowed to speak. While one guy was upstairs, the remaining two huddled in the corner, talking. I could imagine my fate was being discussed. I'd never seen their faces. There was no reason to add murder to their list of crimes, I thought. I knew this, but I was convinced that I'd see the morning. The next few hours were hazy. All the adrenaline had since worn off. Pain was coming in waves so severe I passed out more than once. Death would have been preferable, but due to some fortune it never did. I can't tell you when the gang left. I wouldn't have known how long that I'd spent tied up had not my son told me so later. Yes, my son. His stubbornness would be my savior, just as mine was almost my undoing. After multiple unanswered calls, he began to believe that I was dodging him. The young man drove 45 miles one way just to give me an earful. I thought I was dreaming. His voice echoed down the basement stairs, and I thought that I was hallucinating. It was the paramedics moving me that finally woke me up. For a split second, I believed them to actually be my captors. Their faces were bare, and I was sure death was coming. But my son calmly placed his hands on my shoulders and assured me that everything was over. It's probably clear what followed next. My time in the hospital extended a long period of time with multiple surgeries, and the recovery after that was spent in various casts and a period of time even in a wheelchair. For the most part, I have completely healed. The cold and damp are a chore, but since I moved south, I experience that pain very rarely. As sad as it may sound, I harbor no lasting hatred of those thieves. They may have taken something valuable, but they gave me much more important things back. My life. Nonetheless, when I was notified of their arrest seven months later, I was relieved. Only a small amount of the coin collection was reclaimed, most being fenced long ago. I was surprised to get any of it back at all. Presently, all of these gentlemen are guests of the correctional system, likely for the next 30 years or more. I briefly returned to work after my recovery, but had subsequently since retired. The majority of my days are now spent in leisurely pursuits like fishing and hunting. I learned an important lesson all those years ago. Life is a special yet fleeting thing. You should enjoy every day like it's your last. I'd gladly sacrifice a million coin collections for another day with those I love. Sorry, Dad, but... I think you'd agree. Stay safe, everyone. When we were kids, we don't always listen to the adults around us. Part of growing up requires us to push boundaries or we never know when we've gone too far. It's just a fact of life. Adults know this and try their best to let us learn on our own. Even then, they won't hesitate to put their foot down in the best interest of our safety. I know this now and did the same to my kids when they were young. However, there was a time you couldn't tell me anything. I constantly pushed the boundaries and never learned from my mistakes. That is, until I almost died. In my youth, I was a handful. Too much for my mother, in fact. My dad had been shot down and killed in Vietnam. I had only been two at the time. My mother didn't date and both my grandfathers had passed. I lacked any male role models in my life and mom tried but just couldn't fill this role. This was another time and mom was a small town simple lady. I was old enough to know that she was overworked and not the assertive type. I naturally exploited this. I had not yet fallen into crime but she feared I soon would. She searched out a solution and soon came up with a perfect one. Spring break would soon arrive. She would need someone to look after me during the day. This is when Dad's mother, Granny Jean, came into the picture. Mom and Granny Jean never saw eye to eye, but they kept things civil. As I'd soon discover, Granny Jean was just what I'd needed. She'd grown up in the Depression. 
It made her tough, a no-nonsense type of woman. She had no time for foolishness, but was still capable of showing love when appropriate. The two spoke on the phone and she agreed to take me for the week. I left for the farm on that Sunday morning and arrived by bus later that day. A daunting trip for a lone nine-year-old. Not that I would have admitted it. Granny Jean picked me up at the station and we drove the 25 miles back to the farm in silence. I say silence, but there was a preacher talking on the radio for most of the ride. I began to speak once until I got the stink eye from Granny and figured I'd be better off shutting up. Not until breakfast the following morning did she truly talk to me. Afterwards, I received a quick lesson on feeding the animals and then was left to entertain myself. So, naturally, I took off in search of trouble. Most of the day was spent walking the fields and exploring the woods. I returned briefly for lunch, then renewed my explorations. Around four, I came across this old abandoned farmhouse. It was a massive thing. Two stories and a big wraparound porch. I couldn't resist. I quickly looked through the windows to make sure no one was inside. Seeing nobody, I walked around back and entered. There wasn't much to see, but to me it was like a giant clubhouse. It was getting late, so I left, with all intention of returning. That evening at dinner, I happened to make mention of the old house. No sooner had I said it, Granny Jean jumped down my throat. That's not your property. Don't you go back there. It's old and dangerous, it's not safe, do you understand? I was terrified by her reaction and sheepishly I said, yes ma'am. I was shocked by my own words. I would not been in the habit of respecting my elders, but she was in full control and she knew it. Well, almost full control. That night as I lay in bed, all I could think about was the old house. There was still so much to explore. I had to go back. And I did the next morning borrowing a flashlight on my way out. Beginning where I'd left off the day prior, I climbed the creaky stairs to the second floor. Had I been smarter about the layout of the old houses, I would have tried to explore the attic, but I didn't realize it was there. I did encounter a door that likely led to it, but it being locked, I moved on. I had much more to see. Having found nothing of note at this point, I returned to the kitchen. A door I hadn't yet tried was located there, it was difficult to open, but after a few hard yanks, it broke free. Ahead of me were stairs leading into a basement. The darkness before me screamed, come down, with my borrowed flashlight in hand, I descended down those stairs. One step had long since rotten away, and I jumped it. It's a miracle the step I landed on didn't snap too. Reaching the bottom, I swept the large room with the beam of light. I couldn't see much from my position. Therefore, I made the mistake of taking a closer look. I took two, maybe three steps, and the door above me slammed shut. To this day, I'm not sure what caused it to close. A gust of wind is the most likely guess, but I'm almost positive I closed the back door behind me. I could be wrong. I was never good about closing doors, so no matter how improbable it is actually possible, I'll not entertain any other of the more outlandish theories. I jolted back up the stairs, skipping two or three at a time. I threw myself against the door, but it wouldn't budge. Again and again I did this, but to no avail. And I was trapped. I began panicking. Then, suddenly, I remembered the big swinging doors I'd seen when I arrived. I frantically raced back down, jumping steps in pairs. The second to last broke under my weight, sending me tumbling across the floor. The room was now very dark. I realized my flashlight wasn't working. I shook it rapidly and it came to life. I returned to my feet and renewed my sprint to freedom. The doors were two heavy wooden things that opened out. I needed a lot of power to budge them. I summoned up all my strength and threw my body against them. But nothing. I repeated this twice more until I was too tired to continue. I took a break and tried to think. I closed my eyes and concentrated intensely. I pictured the doors as I'd seen them the day before. My mind's eye scanned every inch, every nail, every board. All hope I had disappeared in an instant. I should have remembered the large board straddling the doors from the outside. It was a sturdy looking 2x4 or something of similar size. 
It spanned the entire breadth of the opening, slid tightly under four metal braces. I'd not lost complete hope just yet. I wandered back and forth around the room examining every square inch. There were a couple of small windows. Perhaps if I broke them I could squeeze out. A nearby brick was put into use, but it just bounced off the panes. I know now that it was reinforced, stormproof glass. No matter the amount of foolish optimism or stubbornness I embodied, as the hours passed, my courage began to fail me. Things wouldn't truly begin to suck until night came on. Although the days had been somewhat warm, the nights still dipped below freezing. As the sun set, my prison became colder and colder. Then, just after 11 p.m., the flashlight gave out, and shaking it no longer worked. With no moonlight, it was completely pitch black. Rats began scattering about all around me, and I was now at the lowest point in my young life. My surroundings terrified me more than the thought of freezing to death. Visions of rats gnawing on my limbs, being too weak to move, overwhelmed me. Sleep became harder and harder to avoid. Even then, I knew if I fell asleep, I might not wake up again. I had no doubt that help would be coming, but would they reach me before I froze, or worse, was eaten alive? Sometime in the early hours of the night, I lost the battle and slipped into unconsciousness. In that sleep world, I could feel my soul being carried upward. I was no longer shivering. My body was warm, and I no longer hurt. This had to be heaven, I thought to myself. And but fortunately it was not my time. I awoke the following morning, but rather than heaven I was back in bed. The smell of baked things floated up from the kitchen and was all very disorienting. Had I just dreamed this, I thought? I looked around, and nothing was out of the ordinary. The sun was shining through the white lace curtains. Rags, Granny Jean's tabby cat, was curled up in the chair watching me. I was wearing my favorite flannel pajamas and all seemed well. Yet just below the surface, something gnawed at me. I slipped quietly into my robe, not wanting to ruin the peace of the morning. Rags followed close behind and I stepped softly down the stairs. The rotten stairs of the basement flashed in my mind. Maybe I was in hell. A proper punishment for such an unruly child like myself. This would be a particularly bitter pill. I expected to be swarmed by a horde of rats any moment. Maybe Rags was their leader. He ran ahead of me and turned the corner, and I braced for the gruesome onslaught, but it never came. I reached the bottom. Looking left, I could see Granny Jean, her back to me, the same gray hair wrapped into a tight bun. She sat at the kitchen table. The calm swaying of an old string instrumental flowed lazily from her little radio. I just stood and watched for a long time, a slight tug of tension lurking just below the surface. A few minutes passed and Granny Jean turned in her chair, kindly wishing me a good morning. I joined her in the kitchen, still unsure of what to say. Are you hungry? The words were comforting yet unsatisfying. Yes, I answered with a quick jerk. I stood still and watched as she gathered the food. She was consumed with her work, yet perhaps even then aware of the turmoil raging inside of me. She cracked two eggs into a skillet. The sizzle and captivating scent of bacon rose in the air. I don't think we need to discuss what happened last night. You're safe now, and I'm sure a boy even as stubborn as you has learned his lesson. The relief was indescribable. I fought back the tears, but a few escaped. The warmth, all the more soothing, I didn't want her to see, and I turned my back to her and spoke. No, ma'am. I see now just how difficult I've been, and I'm sorry. And that was it. Granny Jean plated up my breakfast, and we sat together as I ate, not speaking, the soothing, swaying strings blending into the warm, fragrant air of the kitchen. For the remainder of my visit, I stayed pretty close to the farm. There were plenty of reruns on TV and chores to keep me occupied. I had meant every word I'd said that morning. A veil had been lifted. All the trouble I'd caused, my willful headstrongness, it led me to that cold basement. The adults around me only had the best in mind for me, yet all I ever heard was no. The old version of myself did die that night. 
When the week came to an end, Granny Jean drove me back to the bus station. As we parted, she gave me a little peck on my cheek. I would never felt so grateful in my life, and I still hold a very special place in my heart for her. On my way to the bus, I turned back and waved goodbye to her. Had I known it would be the last time I'd see her, I would have thanked her for it all. She'd not just saved my body that dark, cold night. She'd done one better. She'd saved my soul. It was August 28, 1984. Elizabeth Fritzel had just turned 18. What should have been a happy time in her life was soon to become a living nightmare. At some point that day, Elizabeth would disappear and not be seen again for 24 years. Soon after her disappearance, Rosemary Fritzel, Elizabeth's mother, filed a missing persons report. No trace of her daughter could be found. Then, almost a month later, her father Joseph Fritzel produced a letter postmarked from Braunau, a city a hundred miles from their home in Austria. According to the letter, Elizabeth was staying with a friend. She demanded her family not search for her or she would leave the country. Joseph told the authorities she had probably joined a religious cult. They must have taken him at his word, and nothing else was done to find her after that day. Another 24 years would pass until the world would hear from Elizabeth again. She was never missing. At least, Joseph knew where she was the entire time. As it turned out, that same day that she had turned 18, he had trapped her in a hidden chamber that he had specifically built for her, in the basement. From then on, he would visit her at least three times a week, bring her food and other supplies. What followed involved graphic detail. Because of Joseph's repeated indecent assaults, seven children would be born to Elizabeth in her prison, although one died soon after birth. Three of the children, Lisa, Monica, and Alexander, were removed as infants and raised by Joseph and Rosemary. This was all approved by local social services after Joseph claimed the babies had just been left on his doorstep. Upon the birth of the fourth child, Joseph was kind enough to allow the chamber to be enlarged. Elizabeth and the children were made to dig out every inch of soil by hand. The undertaking lasted several years. As terrible as all this must have been, it could have been far worse. The captives were allowed to have things like a refrigerator, television, and VCR. During their ordeal, Elizabeth taught the three remaining children, Kirsten, Stefan, and Felix, how to read and write. Occasionally, Joseph would shut off the power and forget to deliver them food in order to teach them a lesson. In a couple of different instances, he went as far as telling them that they would be gassed or electrified to death if they attempted to escape. Then, on April 19, 2008, the eldest daughter, Kirsten, fell unconscious. Elizabeth managed to convince Joseph to seek medical attention for her. She assisted Joseph in carrying their child out to an awaiting ambulance. It would be the first time she had been outside in 24 years. Although she was forced to return and stay another week, her nightmare was soon to end. Once again, Joseph arrived with a letter supposedly written by Elizabeth. Fortunately, staff at the hospital found many aspects of his story puzzling and called the authorities. That was when the investigation into Elizabeth's disappearance was reopened. Joseph was questioned and an expert on cults found his story improbable. Because her illness was so severe, Elizabeth pleaded to be allowed to visit Kirsten in the hospital. Amazingly, Joseph agreed, and Elizabeth, along with her two sons, were allowed to leave the basement for the final time. During the visit, a doctor tipped off authorities and both adults were taken into custody. Once she was assured that she was finally safe, Elizabeth shocked Felice with the story of her decades-long imprisonment and abuse. Shortly after midnight, Joseph, now 73, was formally arrested. The next day, Elizabeth, the children, and Rosemary were taken into protective custody. It's believed Rosemary never had any idea of what was happening to her daughter. Over the next few days, DNA would prove Joseph to be the father of Elizabeth's children, although his lawyer would insist this did not prove false imprisonment. 
Police believe Joseph was planning on contriving a story of how he rescued his daughter from the supposed cult to cover for the unexplained appearance of Elizabeth. The trial of Joseph Fritzl commenced on March 29, 2009. He stood trial for the death of the newborn, kidnapping, false imprisonment, and several other despicable actions. Pursuant to an agreement made to her by police, Elizabeth would be allowed to give videotaped testimony before prosecutors. Joseph pled guilty on all charges except murder and threatening to gas Elizabeth and the children. The jurors spent 11 hours that first day watching footage of Elizabeth's testimony. The tape was said to be so upsetting that eight of the jurors could only watch two hours of the testimony at a time. Four alternates were put on standby in case any juror asked to be excused. Elizabeth's older brother, Harold, also testified to being abused by Joseph as a child. The second day, Elizabeth herself appeared at the trial. Joseph was visibly shaken by her arrival, going pale and breaking down. The next day, he would change his plea to guilty on all charges. He's currently serving out a life sentence at Garston Abbey Prison in Upper Austria. He is eligible for parole after 15 years. On a good note, Kirsten was reunited with her family after being put under an artificially induced coma. She has since made a complete recovery. For the sake of the privacy, I won't say where Elizabeth and the children are living today. I will include that they are doing their best to live normal lives and heal from such a traumatic experience. The house that bore witness to these crimes was put up for sale and purchased in December of 2016. The purchasers planned to convert the property into apartments. The basement itself was filled with concrete in June 2013 at a cost of 100,000 euros. Although in an interview in 2017, Joseph still showed no remorse for his actions, and in April 2019, it was reported that his health was in decline and he didn't want to live anymore. But we can only pray that he gets what he asked for, after creating a generational nightmare in a subterranean prison. Everyone around him knew him as Big Joe, but his parents called him Joseph. The Gibsons were friendly and cool for older folks, a lot of parents would have been overprotective of a child with Big Joe's disability, but he was allowed to live just like every other kid. I know now that Big Joe had a condition called Down Syndrome. As kids, we knew he was different, but we didn't care. If he was picked on, we were usually there to stand up for him. Those kids never spoke a word crosswise about him in our presence again. He was everyone's best friend and never expected anything in return. That's why his disappearance affected us all so much. I don't remember the exact date, but I do know that I was nearing 13. Several of us had met up to play baseball. We knew Big Joe loved playing, and he would be sad if we didn't include him. We went to the Gibson's house, and when Mr. G told us Joseph had went away, we asked when he'd be back. I'm sorry, boys. Joseph won't be coming back. He wouldn't say any more, so... With a heavy heart, we walked back to the field and tried getting by without our favorite pitcher. Big Joe may have gone away, but he wasn't forgotten. My friends and I would do our darndest to discover the truth, but it seemed nobody had a clue, not even the adults. There were loads of theories, though. The most popular was that Big Joe had become too much to handle for his older parents. We assumed that he'd been sent off somewhere for his own good. It was an unsatisfactory conclusion, but there wasn't much we could do about it. Life went on and time passed quickly. I worked my way through community college and would eventually become a child psychologist. A few of my childhood friends would reach out now and then. The discussion would always get around to Big Joe. The institutional theory was taken as fact by then and we hoped he was happy and well treated wherever he was. My practice was just beginning to support itself and I decided to take a short vacation with my family to visit my folks. Our first night was without note. It was the next morning when everything changed. The whole family was sat around the table for breakfast. My dad was talking about a new housing development being built. And that was when he dropped the bomb. Oh yeah, did you hear about the old Gibson house? 
I figured he was talking about being leveled for the new development, and I was only half right. They did demolish it, but during the process they found a body buried in the basement. He said it like it was an everyday occurrence. I began to choke. Something like this demanded an explanation. I'm sorry, son. I assumed you already knew. They were in the process of digging for leftover pipes or wires and exposed to skeleton. All kinds of questions were rushing through my head, all except the most obvious one. Both Gibsons passed long ago. No one had lived in the house for at least ten years. I asked if they identified the body, and it was obvious that he was about to make a guess. Come on, boy. You know who it is. You're avoiding the most probable option in favor of the most improbable. This is one of his favorite sayings. He'd throw it at me whenever he thought I was being dense. I fought for a moment, but nothing came to me. He could see the strain on my face. And I remember all of these words like they were yesterday. Okay, stop. Take a few breaths, close your eyes, and it will pop out in front of you. My old man knew me well. I did as he suggested and calmed my mind. Then bang. It hit me like a truck. And my old man had always been able to read me like a book. Big Joe? My excitement quickly switched to confusion and concern. Once again, he could read my thoughts. No, son. It's not what you think. The doctors are almost certain the man died of natural causes. I do want to mention here that although we saw Big Joe as a kid like us, it turned out he was actually nearing 25 when he passed. Although relieved, I was unable to overcome my confusion and disgust. Why hadn't they just buried him the regular way? It's not fair that we didn't get to say goodbye one last time. I wanted answers, but asking Dad would have been pointless. Now that I knew, I had to visit his gravesite as soon as possible and after a small amount of research I did find it, and this was something I was going to have to do alone. I just remember as I stood beside the grave, I began telling him everything he missed since he went away. I told him about my wife and kids, how the Sox finally won the pennant, and then I realized he hadn't missed a thing. He had been with me all these years. I'd been carrying him in my heart the whole time. It wasn't until I reached my thirties that I realized the mistake we'd made. Although what happened was technically illegal, nobody got hurt. Animals aren't people, after all. Only when I began to learn about psychology did Isaiah's behavior actually cause concern. Don't get me wrong, after we made our discovery I wouldn't have left him alone with an ant. All I'm saying is, it took a long time for me to understand how dangerous the kid truly was. By then, it was too late. Mark, nor any other member of his family, has heard from Isaiah in years. I haven't had a good night's sleep since learning this. I'm sure once I tell all of you what the two of us found in that basement, your sleep might be affected too. First things first, a brief layout of the people involved. None of the names I use here are the actual subjects' names. I don't want innocent people getting harassed. It was 2003, neck deep into the summer. I'm pretty sure it was just after July 4th. Both myself and my best friend Mark were 18. Mark also had a younger brother, Isaiah. He was 12. I'd spent almost every day of the past 10 years hanging out at their house. Things at my house were out of control, but this isn't about my home life. Back on the subject, this specific day was super hot. Even the AC was having trouble keeping up. We decided to retreat to the not often used basement in hopes of a cooler place to hang out. Mark and I remained down there for a few hours. At some point we became restless and decided to dig through the boxes on the surrounding shelves. At the very top of one shelf was a big box lacking any labels. We naturally had to know what was inside. I was a little taller at the time so I was chosen to climb up and bring it down. Since I was unable to grab it with both hands, I made the stupid decision, depending on how you look at it, to knock it off the shelf. 
It hit the floor with a dull thud and fell onto its side. That was when the first corpse fell out. We thought it was a hat or something, but when Mark picked it up, it was obviously a dead cat. As soon as he realized this, Mark let out an ugh and dropped it. Our curiosity was only stronger then. I grabbed a curtain rod and flipped it over. The poor beast appeared to have had its insides ripped out. After a short discussion, we came to the conclusion that it had crawled into the box and died, only to have a rat come along and feast on its innards. Satisfied with this conclusion, we agreed to continue our search. I pushed the box back onto its bottom and pulled the flaps open to get a better view. It was immediately clear we had far more disgusting discoveries ahead. I will take this moment to warn anyone who is sensitive to these types of situations to stop now. Although I have already described the death of an animal, it's going to get a lot worse from here. With that out of the way, I'll continue. As I said, I opened the flaps of the box only to be met by a menagerie of dead animals. Most were local pets from the look of them. Mark and I were both appalled and confused. What was this? Sheepishly, I reached in and began to pull out the dried husks. In the end, I found six different dead animals. Underneath the corpses, the box was filled out with Isaiah's old toys. I pushed it aside and started surveying my ghoulish discovery. Five out of the six were cats with an additional one tiny dog. From what we could tell, they had all been strangled or had their throats cut. I still shiver when I think of it. A few of the cats still had the cord wrapped around their throats. This was all too much for the two of us to handle. Mark was adamant that this wasn't his work. So, we did the only thing we could. Mark walked back upstairs and asked his parents to join us in the basement. They were understandably disgusted at what they saw. Once again, Mark swore he wasn't the culprit. There wasn't any question of his parents' guilt. This only left Isaiah. He was in his room at the time. He was called down. When he saw the box, he automatically looked down. This was a clear indication of his guilt. What followed was an hour-long interrogation. I left soon after it began. This is a family matter. Not to mention my view of Isaiah had drastically changed. The little monster freaked me out. Mark would tell me the specifics later. The decision was made to get Isaiah counseling. And that's it. The police were never contacted and the pet owners never knew what had happened to their beloved family members. I can understand not wanting your ten-year-old being labeled as a monster, but that's what he was. Mark said he tried to say the animals had attacked him at first, and he was just defending himself. Their folks weren't buying that. He eventually accepted responsibility and apologized. I wasn't comfortable with this result as a kid, but now that I know that this is a sign of a serial killer... I'm terrified. For a few years, I lost contact with Mark. I went off to college and moved to a new city. I began searching for him soon after. They had moved to a new city not long after I had. It was a fresh start, as he put it. Apparently, Isaiah had stopped attending counseling within months of starting. He began acting out and residents started asking questions. I knew none of this, of course. When I did track Mark down, I would be updated on everything. Our reunion soon fell under a cloud when Isaiah came up. I could tell by his tone, Mark was worried. In subsequent calls, he admitted he was scared of his brother. Although he was relieved to have lost contact with him, he feared for those around him. As I write this, no one has had contact with Isaiah in over seven years. His name does come up in searches, but... He makes sure to move around a lot. So far he shows up in Denver, Los Angeles, Chicago, and most recently Long Island. Obviously these are all cities with unsolved multiple crimes and murders. I'm not sure I'd want to talk to him even if I did track him down. And no Mark doesn't. And now maybe you'll see why my nights are fitful and long. I often blame myself for saying nothing. I catch myself searching crowds for Isaiah's face... But I'll admit I probably wouldn't recognize him now. The hair stands up on my neck any time a person gets too close to me in a crowd. My fears may be unfounded, 
Why would he come after me all these years later? Stupid as it sounds, I still feel terrified thinking about him. Somewhere in the world, maybe in a city just like yours, a real-life monster stalks the streets. Am I his next target? Is he reading this right now? Even as I pray for everyone's safety, something tells me someone won't live to see tomorrow. In the name of all that is holy, stay vigilant and beware of strangers. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just a dollar a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories and big old two to three hour compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links down below. Thanks so much, friends, and I love you so much.